With production music, one size does not always fit all. I mean, from tension cues to corporate cues to happy, clappy ukulele cues and trailer cues, form and function often shift with the needs of the editor and the programming itself. And this is especially true in the world of sports broadcasting. So on today's episode, I sit down and chat with Rob Astor of RR Hot, who is one of only a handful of publishers for CBS Sports. His over 35 years in the business brings with it a ton of knowledge and perspective, and we discuss his journey in the industry, and he unpacks the seven specific types of cues that get used most often in live sports. Plus, we take a listen to a sad piano and strings cue written by a member of the 52 Cues community on this week's episode of the 52 Cues podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Cues podcast, a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about industry topics and take deep dives into the different aspects of being a working production music composer. Plus, we feature a cue written by you, a member of the 52 Cues community, and this week, we're going to take a listen to an untitled sad piano and strings cue written by Chris Hall, so you definitely want to stick around for that. Uh, if this is your first time here, welcome. I'm so glad you found me, you know, however you found me. I know you have a ton of options out there between audio podcasts or videos here on YouTube. So I thank you for spending part of your day here with me. I also must give a special word of thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Qs who help keep the podcast, the channel, and everything here going. We are 100% community supported. So if you like what I do here, don't thank me thank them. But if you want to learn more about how you can help support 52 Qs and also unlock extra perks like live streams, workshops, Zoom feedback sessions, and a ton more, then be sure to click on the links in the description or stick around because we're going to be talking much more about that a little bit later in today's episode. So, you know, if you've been following this channel, you know that one of the big things that I do in the world of production music is sports broadcasting, specifically writing cues for CBS Sports, which is the NFL on CBS, the PGA, the Big Three uh, basketball tournament, and the NCAA tournament, uh, along with anything that CBS Sports Network's does, whether it's bowling, whether it's you know, college lacrosse, and everything everything in between. And so I was really very, very fortunate to be brought along into a, a, a library with Rob Astor. He really kind of gave me my break, if, if you want to, if you want to call it that. And so I was so thankful that he sat down recently and talked all about sports broadcasting, how, how the cues are used, how we have to think about sports broadcasting. And he also gave me a little bit of his own personal history. So without further ado, here's my recent chat with Rob Astor. I am here with Rob Astor of RR Hot, aka Radical Rob's House of Tunes. And listeners might have heard me in the past talk about my publishers. You know, I talk about my publishers, and you might have heard me mention the uh, the mythical Rob, the legendary Rob, who has been in the industry for what, 35 years, 30, it's got to be pushing 35, 36 years. And Rob gave me my start in the industry, gave me my break. You know, you hear stories about there when you when you had your big break and you know, uh, opportunity meets preparation. Well, that was when I was connected to Rob through some folks at Full Sail. And so I want to start by giving a hearty welcome and a hearty thank you to Rob Astor for uh, for for taking me under your wing, doing what I, I, I'm thinking that not a lot of publishers are doing these days, which is helping composers kind of come along. And uh, you poured so much into me that to have you on the podcast is a great honor. Rob, thank you so much. And welcome to the 52 Qs podcast. Well, good morning, 52 Qs. <laughs> and thank you so much, Dave. Uh, 
for the compliments and um, one of my uh, greatest joys and experiences has been uh, our collaborations and, and our collaborations together with the rest of our production team. Um, we've certainly had some interesting adventures, uh, and I'm thinking that the best is yet to come. Oh, yeah, absolutely. From, from your mouth to God's ears, <laughs> right? So, uh, but um, the reason I really wanted to have you on the show and what got it was, it was like an adrenaline shot into my career was sports broadcasting. And I know you do a lot of publishing, not just in sports, but sports is one of your your biggest your biggest hitters. And uh, during during today's chat, I want to talk about sports broadcasting, how it's different from production music in general versus like trailer mm -hmm. music, and uh, kind of where you see sports broadcasting going next. But but first. Tell us a little bit about your story, because I know, you know, you didn't sign up for the industry and say, I'm going to be a publisher. Like <laughs> most publishers, there was a long and winding path leading through like being a composer and a performer and all of that. So tell us a little, a little bit about how you found yourself as a, as a publisher in the industry. I... Uh graduated from university. I'm going to date myself here a little bit. <laughs> I think I probably have a few years on uh, a bunch of your <laughs> viewers. Um, but I uh, graduated from University of Miami Music School down in South Florida in uh, the middle to late 70s. And um, at that time, it was the only fully accredited university in the country to offer a very specific program in the business of music. Mm. And I was one of the first kids to go through that program. And it was uh, really, uh, it was very tough because it was equivalent to having a double major. Um, at, according to the rules of the program, I had to take all of the hardcore uh classes in music that mm. all of the music majors would have had to take. So, <laughs> you know, there were lessons there, there were uh, music theory, you know, music history music and all theory, of that. Yeah. All of that stuff. Um, I had to perform, uh, my scholarship was primarily funded by my work. Uh, I'm a bass player by mm -hmm. trade, by the way. Uh, so at the time, uh, my scholarship pertained to my, double bass work uh, performing with the uh, University Symphony Orchestra. At the time, it was led by a fellow named Frederick Fennell, who was uh, a guest conductor from the uh, Cleveland Orchestra. Uh, and uh, But it, it was a fantastic program, uh, not only due to uh, all the, the different kinds of people that were attending Miami in those times, which I'll tell you in back in a minute, but <laughs> going through this music business program, really, uh, I felt it was quite enlightening. We spent two semesters uh, studying copyright law, mm. and uh, it was very detailed, uh, detail-oriented, and our final exam was actually the part of the New York Bar exam that specifically dealt with intellectual property rights. And uh, it was tough, uh, I'm not gonna lie, but wow. um, I worked really hard, did really well. Um, some of my favorite things about going to Miami at the time is that uh, unlike a Juilliard that's known for its classical or its work in classical literature and programming um, in Berkeley, which tends to have a little bit more of a focus in the jazz scene. Miami was uh, very diverse at the time. And um, uh, it, it was just the, the people coming through were amazing. So, for example, um, one of my favorite classes was Jazz Lab. And my Jazz Lab class, it, I mean, when I think about it now, it's, it was really pretty stunning. Um, I shared 
bass guitar duties with Will Lee, who mm. went on to become the bass player for the Letterman Band. Yeah, um, you know, for all those years, uh, the drummer was Rod Morgenstern. <laughs> uh, you know, who went on to do uh, Dixie Dregs and a million other things. Oh yeah, studio, uh, huge studio guy as well. Y- yeah, Pat Metheny who was our guitar player, our primary guitar player. Bruce Hornsby was playing piano. Um, it was like a rock and roll we, hall of fame in a, in a, it, in a student band. <laughs> it was pretty wild. Um, and our primary vocalist at the time was a lady by the name of Patty Cialfa, who you might better know as Mrs. Bruce Springsteen. And so it was just uh, extraordinary, um, you know, going through the different programs, uh, the music merchandising program was led by a guy named Dr. Alfred Reed, who was a executive vice president of one of the large pop music publishing companies uh, in those days. And um, he was except, excuse me, he was exceptionally bright and um, uh, just a very, very interesting person. Um but anyways, I, I came out of uh, Miami, graduated Dean's List, uh, and um, was, went back home to New York where my family was from, and um, I was really ready to set the world on fire. <laughs> my, my dream at the time was to become an A&R guy at Capitol Records in New York. Why Capitol Records? Because that, at the time, was the home for the Beatles, Yeah, uh, their catalog. Well, the long and short of it is uh, I couldn't get arrested. <laughs> I mean, just for no amount of money, I couldn't even get arrested. So I wound up uh, getting gigs uh, wherever I could, you know, really just to learn. So I worked at one of the big music publishing companies at the time, a company called Bellwin Mills out of Long Island, New York. Um, I worked for the largest talent agency as a, an artist manager and booking agent, um, also out of Long Island, New York. I mean, I used to book shows at uh, the Nassau Coliseum, which is a slightly smaller version of Madison Square mm-hmm. Garden. Right. So I booked, uh, you know, I, we booked Kansas, uh, the band Kansas, and uh, 50s revival, you know, things and all kinds of crazy stuff. And um, while I was working as a talent agent, slash manager, I became friendly with another guy in the office who had just been signed by Atlantic Records to do his first album, which ultimately, uh, and this came out in the summer of 1977, it was called Fire Island, which is a popular summer resort uh, in New York. And um, uh I was actually invited to become project manager for the album. And, uh, God, I, you know, we'd have to have some cocktails for me to get into all those stories, but I've heard of some, I've heard some of your stories and they are jaw dropping, like just, yeah. So anyway, we'll just, we'll just, we'll, we'll just leave we'll, it at yeah. that. <laughs> we'll I mean, I'll that. tell you one, one super quick one. Cause I know we, we have limited time, but working down the hall from us, uh, were the Rolling Stones, and they were working on their album, uh, which ultimately was titled Love You Live. And the kind of inside joke we had with our production crew is that about 98% of that album was studio-based, mm. not live. <laughs> but that's another story. Yeah, that's another So, uh, so early, and- but early on in, in your career, you knew that you wanted to be – more on the industry side of things than necessarily the the composing, writing, performing side of things. What what was it about I, the industry that attracted you, and not the the glitzy, you know, he- headli- I, headlines? I realized a few things, Dave. One thing was when I was at Miami, I was surrounded by the best of the best musicians, mm. and. I just knew that, you know, I could practice 24 seven until my fingers were bloody and all that. And I just, I was not going to be the performer that some of those guys were. So, um, and I, so I think it was maybe a combination of that 
And the one time I was in a, a local band, a punk band, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, and this was in the heyday of CBGBs on the Lower East Side of New York City. And this was when, you know, all the artists that you know, the Ramones, Blondie, uh, you know, Talking Head, all, you know, all that shit was going on. Excuse my language. <laughs> uh, but so I, pl- I, I went out with a couple of my friends and uh, I will never forget in those days, if the audience liked you, they would throw stuff at you. If they loved you, the stuff they would throw would become more dangerous, <laughs> like beer bottles and all kinds of stuff. And uh, so, I, you know, I thought, well, maybe um, – I need to get into a little bit of a safer. <laughs> There's only so much and, chicken wire. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and truthfully, I um, I wound up through a, through uh, a friend and through uh, a New York Times help wanted ad. I stumbled on an opportunity with a small family run music publishing shop. Uh, the company at the time was called Emil Asher. Uh, uh, Emil was actually a real person. Uh, he was, uh, a German immigrant. Uh, he was, uh, at the turn of the century, uh, a very successful, uh, band leader. Mm. And back at the turn of the century, the big, you know, the, the most famous guys were like John Philip Sousa and that kind of music. And Emil used to, uh, he would book the talent on the first cross Atlantic steamships that would sail into New York Harbor. Wow. And, um, and so, uh, he did one of those journeys and he decided to, uh, sort of jump ship and he wound up opening a small shop, uh, in New York city. And, uh, over a period of time, he became a little bit successful as a publisher of that style of music. And then he had two sons, who uh, got involved in real estate in New York City and all that kind of stuff? And um, uh, one of the one of the sons uh, somehow or another fell into uh, uh, some relationships with some international music library businesses. And back, and I'm talking about the early '80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the early '80s. There were there was literally two music libraries, uh, or I should say, there there were two distributors of music libraries uh, in the United States, and Emil Asher was the was the largest one. Mm-hmm. Uh, we represented uh, catalogs from uh, a, a few from England, France, Germany, um, and uh, uh, we were you know, sort of representing their American interests. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I learned a great deal, uh, you know, working for this company um, within a relatively short time. Uh, I should say that most of the people that worked in this office had been there. uh, Well, they were really old timers. I mean, like when I first started working for them, I was a kid out of school for the most part. (laughs) I think I dropped the average age of the office by like about 60 years. <laughs> so, um, and, and so we're talking but, about recorded music, not printed music, but this is music library. That's correct. And, and back then, and we'll, we'll talk about sports broadcasting. So listeners, just hang <laughs> yeah. on. I promise you, this is I, absolutely- I'm sorry, guys. No, no, this is, this is fascinating because I want to know like, what did library music mean in the 80s versus what it means now? Was it all just That's a great question. cassettes or well, was it reel to reel or or how, how was it recorded? It, it was on it uh it was on vinyl mm-hmm. and it was on uh reel to reel tape. And I would tell you that uh the Europeans uh, certainly at that time were way ahead of the industry here. They recognized that uh, there was a need to have pre-recorded music that could be licensed at, for a reasonable fee uh, to all different kinds of uh, television and film advertising projects. Not every client uh, had a big budget mm-hmm. to uh, commission, you know, a, a, an original score. 
uh, or and many times the clients, um, you know, whoever they might be, the television studio or advertising agency, they may not have the money or they may not have the time to actually do an original composition. So it, it you know, for practical purposes, it was just easier mm. to go through a pre-recorded catalog and say yes, no, yes, no, pick this, no to that. Um, you know what you're getting. You know there are no surprises, and uh, and the stuff, uh, primarily the stuff that was coming out of London in those days, was really first class. Um, I mean, the uh, composers were all well-known, well-established guys, uh, you know, that had tons of credits already in big shows, you know, television, mm -hmm. film, et cetera. Um, and it, but it was just very interesting. And, and uh, uh, you know, when you look at it then, uh, when literally um, Emil Asher controlled the marketplace and now it, you have – I mean, I don't know if I'm exaggerating, but <laughs> certainly hundreds, if not thousands of music libraries, you know, it's, it's gotten to the point where the market is just oversaturated mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it's a, it's a little, I don't know if this is a great analogy, but, um, it reminds me of, um, when I used to live in New York and I would go to one of the larger record stores, like a Virgin Records or something. And there was just so much there on the shelves. It was like sensory overload. Mm. And you kind of, you know, and if you're shopping, but you're not really sure what it is you're looking for, it's like, where do you start? Yeah. You know? And, and so part of uh, the charm of, of what I got into back in those days is that I recognized that, um, as good as a lot of the pre-recorded music was at the time, there were clients who kind of wanted to blend. They would take, you know, and part of it was budget restrictions or what have you, you know, sometimes they had champagne tastes, but a beer budget. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, but we would, you know, we would kind of uh, add some of our own mm. original spin to uh, another work and the clients really seemed to like that use that as a springboard and i eventually started working with a lot of independent artists mm. who uh were not signed to a deal um i recognized that there was a need for songs um and uh many times uh even the biggest production studios like you know paramount pictures and sony pictures uh, international and, and so on and so on. Um, they just didn't have, uh, you know, 50 to a hundred thousand to do a license for uh, a hit record, but they still wanted something that sounded like a hit record. Right. And I just started working with a bunch of artists who had different styles and, and sounds. And, um, uh, it was challenging because obviously when you're dealing with vocal stuff, if the lyrics have to kind of sort of match up with what the show is about, yeah. it, you know, in order to make a, a, a match. But in any event, I'm sorry I digress. <laughs> I know we're meant to be talking about sports. And I will say this. The thing that uh, I happen to be a huge sports fan. Uh, my family, as long as I can remember, were into everything, football, basketball, college, pro, this, that, and the other. And, um, I've, and, and even when I was down at Miami in the seventies, at that time, university of Miami, uh, was a powerhouse mm -hmm. and it, they had a, a football dynasty. Um, uh, and for a little while, they also were, they had a championship baseball team. And I could tell you guys tons of stories about all that <laughs> stuff too. But yeah, the Miami but Dolphins was, were winning Super Bowls and like was, undefeated you know, seasons. Yeah, it was a great yeah, time to be in Miami. It was fantastic. But I, I those are my outside of family and friends, my two passions are sports mm. and um, and music. And so for me, it was like a blessing to be able to actually make a living 
doing the two things that I love the most. And what I discovered along the way is that sports really comes down to this. It's about storytelling. Mm. Um, you know, there are people in, in uh, the industry who say, oh, you, you know, you do sports, who cares? <laughs> well, you know, when you compare what, for example, Dave and I do uh, for our projects, there's really very little difference between that and if we were scoring a movie. Because at the end of the day, we're, we're telling a story and uh, we're telling a story through our music. And, and so um, the, uh, the nature of the project will largely dictate what our approach will need to be. And, um, you know, there are a few things and you'll have to forgive me if, uh, 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 if your audience is, uh, expecting everything to only be about sports, but I'd like to, if you don't mind, uh, offer three bits of advice, uh, as your careers begin to blossom. Sure. No, no, go for the, it. The, Ab the, the, the Absolutely. first there are three things, and they're all very easy to remember. The first thing is know your client or know your listener. You need to understand what music they listen to personally mm. versus what they listen to professionally. Why do they not use the music they listen to personally? Why don't they use that professionally? What is it? Where are the differences? You know, why do they go to the left and not the right? Um, I've learned along the way uh, many things by just treating clients like people, like friends, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, I know, like, what cars they drive. I know if they have children. And, the, and you might say, well, you know, I'm a composer. Like, who, you know, excuse my language, but who gives a crap about all that? Right. Well, here's the thing. If you want to be a professional in this industry, you need to have every or put yourself in a position of having every advantage you could possibly have to get the gig over somebody else. Mm. And if you really develop an understanding of who's on the other side of that table, you know, that you're talking to, uh, it can only help you. I'll tell you uh, as an example I discovered uh, several years ago that uh, one of the uh, coordinating producers at CBS Sports had some young school-age kids who apparently were quite into music. And so the fact that this guy had young children at home and he listened to their music. So here's a guy, <coughs> excuse me, that if he had his wish list, he probably try to use Pink Floyd and Zeppelin and, you know, that kind of stuff. But he was listening to uh, the, his kids stuff, which was kind of more pop, top 40 kind of stuff. And it kind of influenced his vision in terms of the shape he wanted to put on shows like uh, the NFL Today, mm. which is one of the longest running football pregame shows in the history of television. And he had a vision of changing up the sound largely based on his children's taste. So this is, a, again, it comes back to know your client. Who is that person that you're, you're trying to do business with? The number two, know your project. What are your goals? What are the deadlines? How much music does the project actually call for? What styles and sounds is of interest to the client? Will you need other musicians to help or could you handle it all on your own? Mm -hmm. When will this project actually go to air? Ask questions. Don't be shy. Be a good listener. Mm -hmm. Very important to be a good listener. Number three, and this may be the most important thing to remember of anything. Remember. This project is not, underline the word not, <laughs> this project is not about 
your personal tastes. It's about figuring out what the client is really telling you. And then you need to translate the client's vision into the music that will win you the project. So those are, you know, sorry for the long. No, thing no, there, that's those, that's but, that's gold. Absolutely, it's things we talk about uh, here on the podcast all the time, and to hear it reinforced from someone with literal decades in the industry, with thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of placements. Uh, no, it, it's it's completely true, and and it's it's something that that I think we all have to learn as we transition from making the music we want to make to making the music that can help make a living, right? Because at some point, yes. somebody's going to have to give you money for Absolutely. for the music, and we have to meet, we really have to meet their expectations. It's, it's something that, that, that we've talked about all over the channel at 52 Qs, and uh, like I said, if, if you're wanting to make a living making music, then you have to give what they're asking. You have to give them what they're what they're asking for. So no, it's totally fine that that that, that you went over that. I really really appreciate that. Well, uh, I will tell your audience <laughs> that uh, I have two children. Uh, my youngest child is a huge hip hop fanatic, and for years and years he was uh, mad or angry with me because I wouldn't even entertain the idea of working with hip hop for our sports projects. And, you know, everything is cyclical and everything changes. We live, we don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, you know, the world is fluid and everything's changing all the time. And of course, you know, Dave and I and our, Colleagues have to be able to uh, go with that flow. And my son was so like over the moon <laughs> happy. Uh, Dave was crushing out these hip hop tracks. And uh, my son said, you know, this really should be a record. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you what, that was maybe one of the nicest things he's ever said. Wow, that's, <laughs> so that's high kudos. praise. Kudos to you, Thank sir, you. Dave. <laughs> well, I, and, and I think it, it speaks to, you know, see a need, fill a need. I mean, that's why I was brought on board. It's like the, the folks uh, who are already with you recognize that here's here's a here's a gear we don't have, right? Yes. And so let's find someone out there doing it and and who, who does it yeah. really well. I mean, if I may say, <laughs> I <can> say myself. <laughs> um, and so instead of getting like somebody who writes, you know, metal, so here, let's try right. your hand at hip hop. Let's find somebody who's 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 already got a beat on it. And uh, it was, yeah, I think uh, some false starts during the fir my first NCAA tournament season. Uh, but my first weekend of football, I remember driving home from church, and I get a text from Rob, and it's like, well, like within the first five minutes of the NFL today, he's like, oh, we just heard Red Zone Rundown, and here's Come At Me, Bro, and we're off to the races. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I... And and they, those two uh, jams in particular have become they, chestnuts They get played to every year across like all of their sports, like... Bowl, yeah. bowling uh bull riding golf, golf. <laughs> yeah it shows up in golf it showed up in yeah. collegiate um volleyball like f women's collegiate volleyball which is a thing that they broadcast over at like cbs sports network and uh i'm just waiting for it to show up in like cricket and <laughs> championship <laughs> darts and all those things yeah hell yeah well hey listen would you mind if we talked a little bit about the actual uh what makes sports a little bit Abs different? Yeah, that's that's a hundred percent. We're we're yeah we're vibing here because that was going to okay. be my next question. Because one of the things Excellent. we talk about on the podcast, you know, we talk about tension cues and dramedy cues and happy ukulele, but sports broadcasting, like trailer music, is its kind. It's it's its own thing. It it, it uh, obeys some of the laws of production music and mm -hmm. bends some of them and flat out breaks some of them. So so t tell our listeners and and help help remind me because I can frequently find <laughs> myself pushing out. Uh, but yeah, where does 
tr- uh, where does sports music really start to diverge from what we know from production music you might hear on HDTV or Discovery? Well, th- those are all excellent uh, points, Dave. Um, you know, we were talking a few minutes ago about how, in some ways, the music we do for sports is not different from writing music for other forms of media um, because it's storytelling, Mm -hmm. you know, Uh, it might be a little bit of a different kind of storytelling, but it's still, it comes down to storytelling. But using your example, what is the difference between a trailer? Let's say like a Marvel comics, you know, huge, epic, um, um, you know, action adventure, as opposed to, uh, you know, like a football track. Mm-hmm. Well, when you're looking at a trailer, one of the bigger differences is uh, it's mostly music and pictures. When the kind of projects we tend to do are very densely layered with announcer tracks. And one of the, uh, the responsibilities we have is to not step on the announcers. So we have to provide an interesting underscore, so to speak, that supports the announcers. And, you know, it it could be, um, you could be looking at anywhere from two to five different announcers with crowd sounds and, and all that. So, you know, the feed that comes out of the mobile trucks you know, like, for example, if we're talking about a football game, you know, they have like a small army of mobile trucks, uh, you know, uh, all the cameras located throughout the stadium, the sound guys, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they have, you know, anywhere from two to five announcers plus crowd, uh, sometimes sound effects. So the audio track is already pretty dense. And what what do we want to add so that we could add a little, I don't want to use the word tone because tone kind of suggests nothing really, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just an underpinning of some sort. So we want to inject some sort of personality. So for example, if, if uh, an exciting big play just occurred, we want to be able to ramp up our music so that it helps the announcer in in their narration it gets them excited mm. you know and it works cohesively without stepping on the announcer so you know there there are different tricks of the trade on how do you do that but that would be one thing in particular that what we do is different from like trailer writing um it's also what we do is different from writing a record you know when you're when you're doing a record um, you know, let's set, suppose, for example, that you're, you're writing in a conventional song form, you know, A, B, A, whatever, you know, bridge, blah, blah. So, uh, you know, you, you, you lay out your song, there's a certain amount of development, you have a section maybe where, you know, your lead guitar player gets to step out a little bit and play. Um, when you're doing a sports track, uh, well, there are a bunch of things to take into consideration. The first thing is, is that, uh, television, generally speaking, has changed over the last however many decades so that everything now is very compact. You know, uh, you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with the proverbial 10 second sound bites, yeah. you know. Yeah. That's the world we live in uh, regularly. Not everything we do is 10 seconds, but it's kind of like we need to be prepared to have our piece speak in 10 seconds yeah. if that's what the gig is. So an example of that might be um, uh, a show is bumping out of the show or the game. They're bumping out of that into a commercial break. And very often, they may only have 10 seconds. So in 10 seconds, imagine as you're the writer, there's really no time for an intro. 
you have to just have a strong downbeat and sort of get right to the meat and potatoes of your theme or whatever it is you're doing and then have some sort of an ending. So it's almost like you're, you're creating a complete thought in 10 seconds and that could get very tricky sometimes. Um, but let me uh, go on to share a few other things with you. In sports, there are basically seven different applications that we are writing for. Uh, one application, which usually generates the most income, uh, is an area called highlights. And highlights uh, is typically uh, action-oriented footage. So, you know, in football, it's, it's uh, you know, guys, you know, killing each other on the field, right. you know, big hits, you know, quarterback fades back, throws a Hail Mary, it's a caught, you know, huge play. Um, but, it's, but it's action footage. So it's like, what kind of music works for that? Well, um, over the years, uh, network television, not just CBS, but all the big networks have changed up their, their sounds a bit. You know, back in the day, they used to use stuff like Metallica. Mm. Uh, uh, that has gone away and has been replaced now more with um, energetic uh, pop rock, but with a little bit of an edge mm -hmm. to it uh, so that the music drives the visuals. It really pumps, you know. Uh, it, it creates the feeling of action and excitement, gives you a sense of tension. Uh, and tension in highlights music is important because it gives you the sense that this is a contest. Mm -hmm. There's real competition. There's a lot of money on the line for whoever wins. Um, and also the music has to have a little bit of a release, some uplift, uh, you know, which symbolizes triumph. Um, the music in highlights does develop a little bit, um, you know, from uh, probably every four to eight bars, there's some sort of a change. And then probably uh, eight to 16 bars is a bigger change. Um, and, and so it just keeps it interesting. You know, the music keeps chugging along. It has to stay even keeled. There can't be any breakdown sections in a highlights piece because the clients view that as a groove breaker. Uh, and uh, it also throws off their momentum for video editing. So they like it to just be even keeled from beginning to end, usually about two minutes uh, a track. The second most uh, popular category uh, we would refer to as graphics or stats. Um, and these are just static pictures on the TV screen. So it will give you like uh, uh, the quarterbacks, mm -hmm. the, you know, the quarterback, how, how well he's doing in today's game, you know, how many times was he intercepted? How many passes did he throw? How many times did he hand the ball off to the fullback? Um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, you know, these are just, you know, static images that have, you know, really no movement by themselves. It's certainly not the uh, exciting action footage we'd see in highlights. So what music would work for graphics? So I, I can fan. answer that. <laughs> yes. Dave is the king. Yeah. It's the hip, it's graphics. hip hop graphics. Uh, hip hop gets used for graphics all the time because it's just a, a, a floating image with a ton of numbers, lots of information coming at you. So uh, the, because it's not action oriented, it needs to kind of lay into a pocket a little bit more. And so hip hop gets used yeah. a lot for that. Uh, I, I have noticed that the camera work has changed a little bit with graphics, especially with these large, you know, LED panels, which they can actually yeah. capture on camera. So instead of having a floating graphic put in post or whatever, now it's it's an actual video element in the room. And so the, the right. camera will kind of just dolly back and forth just to give a little bit of motion. But at the end of the day, it's a wall of numbers that uh, somebody's talking over. But uh, hip hop gets used a ton for that. Yeah, and, and all great points. Um, uh, Dave has done uh, some of the great 
hip hop tracks that have come out of our house uh, for for graphics, which are used incidentally quite a bit in the pregame shows mm-hmm. and the halftime shows, post game reports. That's where you you might see these kinds of things. And I would say that uh, the the hip hop and and even uh, funk that yeah. Dave yep. has done um, it it provides sort of an interesting texture behind these static pictures so that it, it creates the illusion of movement, but, and, and, it, and it's something more than just tone. I mean, there is some elements of personality, which is, you know, really kind of cool. Um, and, but the music is cool. It's, it's cool. It's not emotional. Uh, it's, it's, um, it, it has maybe a feel of light tension to mm-hmm. it. And, uh, sometimes it could even be a little playful, Sometimes you can have a little bit of swagger to it. And I should point out also with the highlights, going back to that for a second, that's also music that it, it virtually ha- – it, when I say use the word cool, I don't mean as in hip. Mm-hmm. I mean as emotionally neutral. Right. It has to be emotionally neutral because we're not uh, – part of our gig is not to – Edit, help editorialize what's on the screen. We're merely there to support what's on the screen. And, you know, if you're beginning to tap into uh, emotions, that could be perceived as, you know, sort of putting an editorial slant where it doesn't belong. So just, you know, something that's else to note. consider. Yeah, that's a good note. Uh, the other area that we've done a, a bunch in is called bumpers. Mm-hmm. And we, we used that word a minute ago. Bumpers are uh, short segments that segue out of a program into commercial break or coming out of commercial break back into the show or the game. And they timing wise, they could be as little as 10 seconds. They could be as much as a minute. Very rarely would it go over a minute. And again, this is an area where no intros to the song. Intros are just not helpful. They want to, you know, start their video right on a hard downbeat. Um, yeah, because these are these get, are these are getting tossed in live, right? So, so yes. like the editor the, or the producer doesn't have Great like point. time to like scrub to a good transient, and then good point. It's just like they're they need to fire it, fire it, fire it, go. Yeah, and so you know these sports cues, whether it's highlights or or graphics or or bumpers or whatever. They need to hit the ground running. And that was a huge adjustment for me, a huge adjustment, either coming from the artist brain where like, I'm telling a story, you know, in a three act structure and I, you know, I have to set a scene. No, you need to hit it, hit it fast within the first five seconds. You need to be at like full loudness and, and hit it because again, live they're, they're getting dropped in live and no, and no producer is going to scrub to a, a good starting point. Yeah. That's very well said. Mm-hmm. You know, but I, I have to uh, add to that a little bit. One of the least favorite experiences Dave has had with me <laughs> uh, early on was Dave would have written this magnificent piece, uh, uh, just beautiful, beautifully done. And I would come back to him and say, Dave, they're telling me that they want to use it but it's not big enough. Oh my gosh. Yep. <laughs> uh, bigger, bigger. And so Dave has already laid out a hundred tracks or more <laughs> and he's, you know, kind of yelling at me. It's like, Rob, what do you want me to do? <laughs> I guess I'll get <laughs> a 3000 done... piece orchestra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so in, you know, that is, is one of, um, that is definitely one of the differences between writing for sports and other kinds of television productions is that, uh, well, a few points to that. The, our ears have collectively been spoiled over the last 20 years with digital, the perfection of digital sounds. And when you have composers you know, like a Hans Zimmer and all those kind of guys who have created these uh, epic sounding uh, 
sonic environments, for the lack of a better way of saying it, we all kind of got used to that mm-hmm. after a while. And the truth is, you cannot find those sounds anywhere. Those sounds individually do not exist anywhere. So, uh, but the client is expecting to hear that. That's right. So then it becomes a question of, you know, how do you get bigger? And, and Dave uh, could certainly speak better to that than I can. But, you know, it's, uh, we've, we've layered, uh, I mean, it's, it's a lot of layering. Sometimes it's combinations of sounds that you would not ordinarily expect uh, yeah, to yeah, yeah. Yell together, yeah. layering, you know, different orchestral sample libraries, putting in like synth stuff underneath it. Um, but it just becomes such a huge challenge in the mix because it can't sound super squash and overly compressed, and and it's a tightrope. And writing writing those types of cues feels more like writing trailer music because, like in the third act of a trailer, you need to get that big, but um, you just don't have time for things to kind of unfold unfold slowly. And so it just needs to it has to start big, get bigger, and end huge. Right. So, so that's how, and all, all while, right. All while right. Walking the tightrope of can't have a breakdown. Right. So it has mm-hmm. to get bigger, but it also can't be huge swaths of energy. And so uh, it's, it's, it's a very unique challenge, very unique challenge yeah. writing music for sports. Absolutely. So moving on, the next category is called tease, mm. a teaser or a show open. And that generally is uh, anywhere from a minute to maybe as long as two and a half minutes. Uh, And it really is like a mini movie. Mm -hmm. This is one of those rare times where there could be a little bit of an introduction, something that uh, uh, you might refer to as like a table setter. You're setting the table for what's to come. So there could be a sense of anticipation, maybe a little bit of mystery uh, or suspense. And then it's a matter of how do you build from there? How does the music unfold? Now, for us, we've learned along the way that usually the intro will build over the course of about 20 to 30 seconds. And then at that point, there's usually some sort of a, it could be a big cymbal roll or a timpani roll and it's or an orchestral swell and it goes into the next section mm-hmm. and and then today's point you know it just gets bigger and bigger and more exciting uh so the the first section which is like the table setter um you know that would probably be uh a smaller ensemble mm-hmm. kind of sound and then as the piece unfolds it's just you know uh, more and more instrumentation, the chart, you know, explodes. Um, that's usually the section where uh, the network will show highlights. Yeah. So in the course of this show opener, you know, first will be a little bit of an inset table set or intrigue. Then it goes, you know, into the next section, which will show these, you know, action oriented, uh, exciting pieces of footage And then as that unfolds, it will go into another section, which um, ultimately becomes what they would call the payoff. Mm -hmm. And the payoff is when, um, you know, Iron Man 3 wins the battle. (laughs) Uh, You know, the world is good again. And, um, you know, and then we sort of wind the piece down and maybe feather it out, you know, to the end. Uh, by the way, talking about endings uh, while we're on that topic, believe it or not, endings are very important in sports. The reason is uh, because more often than not, they like to be able to go to black. They like to fade to black. And so they like like a very strong final chord, which you would hold for possibly two bars, maybe even a little bit more than two bars. So if it's a power chord or if it's an orchestral trailer kind of thing, you know, you might want to beef up the end with some pedal tone underneath 
really to give it some uh, large kahungas, you know, <laughs> uh, and and so that it doesn't, you know, just kind of fizzle out to nothing. Uh, TV sports really likes that yep. a lot. Yeah. Um, the next category, and I'm sorry, everyone, we have two more after this one. This is called a retease, and a retease is kind of like an abbreviated tease or show open. The difference is um, reteases are usually, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to confuse anybody. <laughs> it's a little like the, the usage is like a bumper mm -hmm. where you would come out of commercial break back into the game. And, but, but the, the retease is very dramatic and it hits hard right on the first downbeat. And it's like a kick ass in your face the most epic sounding movie trailer you've ever heard in your life for, for 25 seconds. Yeah. Let, let me, let me take kind of how I think of these. Uh, the, 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 the bumpers are, are, are a little bit more energetically neutral, right? I mean, it's high energy or right. whatever. A lot of times they use dance and kind of EDM and funk and yes. that kind of thing. A, a tease is very much like a trailer. And I write my sports teases the same way I write, a trailer three act structure with big edit points and super moody melodically and then ending epic right um with act two being the development and the build whereas the retease is the bumperification of of a tease right it's kind of taking that third act and just pushing it super fast uh, or pushing it hard right out of the gate that's how i kind of think about those you have your tease which is very trailer mm -hmm. and the retreat retease is the bumper ification of the tease that's now whether that works or not you you tell me um but uh that's how i approach them compositionally yeah no that's great that's absolutely right yep so moving on two more categories one is called feature stories mm -hmm. What feature stories are, they're basically up close and personal stories. Uh, it may include off the field, behind the scenes storylines. So there's more of a sense of intimacy, if you will. So, you know, it could be about an athlete coming off the injury list and working where they, working their way back into a lineup. Um, music is absolutely only used as an underscore and a supportive role. And depending on what the storyline is, uh, it could be like light hip hop, mm -hmm. could be light pop. Um, some of the producers have a style that they refer to as in quote, traveling music, mm. which uh, could be interpreted as like a, um, uh, uh, like if you're familiar with the wallflowers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of their stuff, it's kind of like folk pop rock. Yeah. You know, it's light motion. It's kind of airy a little bit. It, it's not totally rocked out. You know, there aren't wailing guitars. Um, so anyways, feet, but feature stories again, could depending on um, what the storyline is, as long as it's, a light, it's a light underscore. Yeah, much. yeah, and you can even get into like some te <coughs> tension type type cues. Yeah, and these yeah. are just <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong. These are produced ahead of time, so they yeah. are they're not live segments. And these get used a ton during pregame show yes. and the postgame show. And the and the Super Bowl air that I got a couple of years ago on Super Bowl Sunday was uh, I think three uh, two placements during feature stories, and one was during the live pregame. But they were right. feature feature placements. And so, yep. Yeah, yeah. And so the last thing uh, is would be referred to as sponsored segments. Mm. And these are generally from 30 seconds up to two minutes. The story, for as an example, the story may be about how to hit certain kinds of golf shots. Um, and they, But this, they would be using the golf company's equipment. Right. It would be so, for example, uh, some of the manufacturers are tailor made, Titleist, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it would be a sponsored segment because the sponsor's putting up money to shoot whatever this thing is. 
and it would feature their uh, equipment. So they they do that once in a while. It, you know, it's it's really a only once in a while kind yeah. of thing. Um, I want to see if I. So yeah, let, let, let me let me uh, recap. I, I want to see if I can remember all these. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try. I'm gonna you're quiz me. All right. So first is highlights. <laughs> all right, that's number one. Number yes. two is graphics. Number three is bumpers. Yes. Number four is teases. Yes. Number five is reteases. Number six is graphics. And number seven is sponsors, sponsored, well done, sponsored, sponsored well features, done. which kind of are on offshoot of the featured stories, but aren't quite as like emotional. <laughs> emotional. Did I get them all? Yep. You're very good. It's, it's, as, very, very it's good. as if I've been writing sports music for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely, and very and very good at. Well, it, thank I you. Uh, that's high praise. Thank you. Thank you um, so much. You know, in terms of just some other random thoughts, mm-hmm. um, this is you know, like how do you get started in in this end of the business? And it, that's a really hard question to answer because there really are no easy answers. Um, I will tell you uh, to be fair that I will not lie to you, this industry has become highly, highly competitive. Um, we, Dave and I, and we, we have like a very small team that we uh, work with regularly. And um, uh, it, uh, we compete not only against hundreds or even thousands of music production companies, not just in America, but worldwide. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been in competitions with companies out of London and Paris and so on. Um, But we're also in competition with uh, record, all the record labels and music publishing companies. And the reason is, is that um, it took a lot of people in the industry to, it took them a minute to wake up to the fact that everybody's looking to make an extra buck Mm -hmm. wherever possible. And I don't know why it took a little longer uh, for so many people to to recognize that what we do. A global pandemic probably probably tipped the scales a little bit. I think that's a fair (laughs) assessment. Um, But, you know, so so the thing is, don't get discouraged. Um, It's very good. Uh, to get to know people like Dave, who are amazingly talented, uh, wonderful teachers, um, you know, who know people. If you have the ability to, to hang out, uh, you know, if you know people uh, at your local advertising agency or local television station, go hang out, yeah. you know. Uh, there, there was an old buddy of mine, you know, back in the, uh, the eighties who taught me in some ways, there's really nothing better than hanging out. And I used to do that. I, I actually, part of my school of, uh, you know, paying my dues and school of hard knocks is I used to sort of walk the halls of ABC sports, NBC sports, CBS sports. Then I would get into the news departments. Then I would get myself invited to, uh, you know, when they were broadcasting a game. I actually have spent a considerable amount of time uh, uh, in the mobile trucks Mm -hmm. uh, with various production crews. So it it really, uh, over time, it, 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 it enabled me to see these stories through the eyes of the clients Mm. and, and that if you could develop that set of skills, you will be very successful. And, 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 uh, and let me, let me brag on you because if, 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 if you could look up how to do like networked relationships, right. In the dictionary, it would, it would, your face would be right there because I, I believe and I brag on you to, to all of my students, whether it's full sale or whatever, I brag on on how you do this right, right? You 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 send the letters, you know, you send the thank yous, you send the, like the Christmas gifts and all of that stuff. You're 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 super friendly. You will you will talk to anybody about anything. Super affable. 
easy to get along with, very approachable, but there is an authenticity to that relationship from you, Rob, and I don't mean to embarrass you, but there's an authentic authenticity to it that doesn't come from this motivated by dollars and what can you do for me, but it's very much a service-minded kind of a thing. And it's no it's no wonder you've had, you know, nearly 40-year career in the industry Thank at the you. very, very Thank highest, you. highest echelons of the business. You know, it's, it's no surprise at all. I, and, well, I feel <laughs> I feel very blessed. <laughs> I mean, really, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I'm just a humble guy. Uh, I'm a sucker for a good story. I'm a sucker <laughs> for a good song, a good cue, you know. And and um, having had the pleasure of working with many different people over my career, I feel particularly blessed uh, to be working with folks like yourself mm -hmm. and Danny and, and Steve, you know, and, and you know, the the usual crew, um, our, I, and, and for me, uh, I guess, you know, it would be fair to say part of my job as a publisher is, uh, sales, you know, it's, it's, it's raising awareness of what we do, uh, and hopefully, you know, build our business, yeah. uh, bring in more clients. And I will tell you that, um, to me, it's not selling. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, I, I just love what we all do so much. Uh, you know, I probably, I take it very personally. You know, every time we do a project together, I treat it like my own child. <laughs> uh, you know, I become very, uh, I want to say possessive, but that's not actually what I, I mean. Just in uh, invested in it. I, I, I be, yes, I become very invested in it. And if we don't get immediate positive response it's like what you know are you kidding yeah, me yeah no i when, this is I've, I've noticed when i've gotten some things that that we were both convinced this is a home run and it didn't get air i absolutely felt like you were you were uh pained alongside me because we <laughs> yeah. are we're partners in this i, yeah, I use the analogy yeah. we're in the same boat yeah. row in the same yeah. direction you're just on that side and i'm on this side you're in the port i'm on the starboard or whichever is, is whatever which which brings me to um I, and i want to tell our listeners because rob has been generous and, and is kind enough. He is going to be joining us at the 52 Qs for the friends and family for our monthly workshop for October. So on, on, on October 24th from 5 to 6.30 Eastern, Rob is going to hold a workshop about sports broadcasting, but it's not just, you know, teaching you. Rob has, has agreed very generously to listen to your sports Cues. So if you've ever wanted feedback, not from, you know, not from, not from me, not from, you know, a, a, a somebody just, you know, internet stranger or whatever, but, but getting real world feedback from somebody with nearly 40 years in the industry and in the sports broadcasting, then you can have that opportunity because from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time on October 24th, for the friends and family subscribers of 52 Cues, Rob is going to be listening to whatever sports cues you want to send his way. So Rob, thank you. I'm really looking forward to that. Looking forward. And that's, if you want more information uh, about all of that, about how you can not only support the channel because we are listener supported, but if you want to uh, learn how you can join up with the friends and family and uh, possibly submit your cues to get them heard by Mr. Rob Astor, then, um, then do that. Check out the links in the description and the information below. Well, Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for for all of that information. It, and you've given me, again, somebody with, with, I guess I'm going on like almost 10 years in this industry. You're giving me stuff to think about. I'm like, huh, okay, all right. No, that that absolutely helps. And uh, here's to another, another 10 years uh, because, uh, like I said at the beginning, I would not be. I, I probably wouldn't be wearing this shirt. I wouldn't be doing any of this uh, if it weren't for not only – your generosity, but your kindness, and you're willing to kind of take a shot on somebody who had zero, zero industry credits to his name. And my uh, career, uh, a lot of it is owed toward to, to you. So thank you so much, not just for that, but for joining me today. Thank you, my brother, Dave. Love and respect. Uh, you know, you're, you're the best. 
Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> you know, look, I, I um, there's a lot of love in the room. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and by the way, in case you're wondering, the, the conversation we're happening, having right now, it's like every call I've ever done with Rob is filled with as much love and a bunch of laughing and talking. This is how it is. This is, this is folks, this is what relationship really looks like. It's not just faceless person out there at the other end of an email address. So Rob, thank you for being such a fantastic example. And thank you. I feel very fortunate that you were my first kind of my first foray into this. And I felt, I felt I was in fantastic hands, but thanks. Thanks again, Rob. Really appreciate you. It was a lot of you. fun, Dave. Yep. I appreciate it. Thanks for having yep. me. And we'll see you on October 24th. Once again, I have to give a huge, huge thanks to Rob, not just for for sitting down and chatting with me and, and, and talking about sports broadcasting and just really sharing everything he knows, but also really for taking me under his wing, being very, very patient as I learned the industry. I, I only hope that that you can have a rob in your life to help to help you along the way help you along your journey so we're going to take a quick break and when we return we are going to be uh taking a listen to an untitled sad piano and strings instrumental cue written by chris hall but first a few words about 52 cues Hey y'all, I'm Shannon Croft, and I want to tell you that the 52 Cues podcast is made possible by viewers and listeners just like you, composers and producers who are looking for a better way to connect and collaborate. You see, 52 Cues isn't just another website selling static, pre-recorded videos to a mass audience. It's a fun, vibrant, and positive community that comes together online for sharing cues, getting feedback, and discussing what's up in the production music industry. You'll find both personalized feedback and live interaction, which are the best and fastest ways to grow your skills and earn more placements. The best part is that the 52 Cues community is absolutely free. And when you're ready to take your career to the next level, we offer friends and family subscriptions, which unlock weekly live streams, live interactive group feedback sessions, monthly interactive workshops, and more. Head over to 52Qs.com and sign up today. And while you're there, check out our personalized feedback videos, private lessons, and of course, merch. I can't wait to see you at 52Qs.com.
was an untitled uh, Sad Piano and Strings instrumental cue. I'm assuming, I'm assuming untitled uh, by Chris Hall. Thank you so much for sending this along. This was sent uh, during our, or or for our week 40 weekly feedback thread. And uh, there's some really, really nice writing here. My my big takeaway from this, I mean, I, I think, I think that the piano playing is 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 really fine, and the strings are really really good string sounds. Um, um, but I think the big thing that I that I'm really noticing is it seems like it's in mono. If it is, if it's not specifically in mono, then it feels like the stereo stereo field is really really narrow, and it just feels kind of monoy and thin. And I feel like there could be more low end in the mix. And I think that's a product of, of the mono. I don't know if it was summed to mono, but um, but just be really, really careful. It could be that you, you're running things through a uh, an effect, and that effect is set to mono. And so if you're if you're not if you're not sending it as a, an aux send, but you're actually running it through that plugin, then it might be converting it to mono but this is really 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 nice writing again the strings sound sound really 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 nice but that's that's the big takeaway this feels like it's in mono uh and in the low end really missing the low end of the strings and and, I, and e even the uh even even the piano feels like there's just kind of no no low end no subby bass 100 you know 200 hertz and below and that I, i'm really really not hearing it uh and since it is kind of summed to mono here in the middle it feels like everything's kind of right on top of each other because we don't have the benefit of stereo spread really helping to kind of widen it out so um I think the strings could probably come down just a little bit, and I think we could probably let the strings breathe a little bit more, especially early on. I'm gonna I'm gonna back it up just a little bit here, just to let them breathe a little bit. I, I really like your tempos. I think that could have snuck in a little bit more delicately. And then kind of diminuendo. Kind of breathe in and then breathe out, which you have, you have some of that. And, and also create a little bit of separation in that string programming. Again, think about, especially when it's kind of like a, a little quartet like this or a string quartet or string quintet or whatever. And it's not a whole, it's not a whole uh, section of strings where you really can't hear where notes begin and end. And so a little moment like this. You probably want to create a little bit of separation when the chords change. I mean, again, think about everybody kind of bowing and then they're gonna up bow or is it gonna be a re-articulation of a down bow? And not that we have to get too in the weeds about that kind of stuff, but it's just a consideration. Two, three, four, five. right. So if you're thinking, you know, they're kind of going up and then and then they're the whole the quartet is all, you know, they're all making eye contact and looking around. They're all gonna re-articulate. Now, this is something that we usually have to take into consideration anytime we are programming, um, anytime we are programming winds. Because one of the giveaways for fake wind sounds isn't necessarily the articulations themselves, and how good the quality of sounds and the legato transitions. Often, what subconsciously gives it away, that uncanny valley, is when we as MIDI programmers don't program places where our virtual wind players would breathe. Give, give give your virtual players a spot to breathe. We don't necessarily have to do that if we're just you know programming along because it's virtual. But I think that creates a little uncanny valley moment, and it's just a little unsettling. And once you kind of tune into it, then you can't not hear it. And so putting things like 
in our in our string quartet here. Them all lifting their bows and rearticulating with a down bow, a down bow technique, I think will really help. All right, even even your your piano goes back into the opening motif here. All right, so your pianist would have kind of lifted their hands and played, you know, up the octave going back into the original motif. And so we want to we want to join the strings with that. We want to give them a little bit of a lift, not a huge thing. You know, it's not a caesura or anything, but just a little lift so that the the whole quartet lifts their bows and all join on a down bow together. <laughs> And so if I back this up, the loudness of the strings feel about the same loudness the first time through as they do the second time through. A little bit stronger, actually. And so I think we could, we could exaggerate that by bringing the strings down a little bit more in, the, in the, the, the first time they enter. So it's still very much a piano feature. And then you can have these single notes. Da, da, da. You can have those kind of emerge from the texture before settling back in, back into the mix. Another separation moment. Right, that, that's another great spot for a separation. Again, it's 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 like you don't want your string players just kind of sawing away the whole time. You want to give them, you want to make it feel like a, a, a group of, of players all playing together. And if you're just connecting every MIDI note after MIDI note after MIDI note, it just becomes this kind of, this constant like onslaught of sound. And so, and I don't mean like onslaught, but just, you know, it's just constant, constant sound. And we're not used to necessarily hearing that. We're used to hearing the natural tendencies of, of how music, we're just used to, to these lifts, these moments. Again, with, with wind players especially, you have, to, you have to bake those in. But those also translate to, those also translate to string players, non-wind instruments. This is something that when I was learning to do jazz improvisational solos on drum set, my teacher would actually have me breathe. He would say, you have to take a big deep breath before you start soloing. And when you run out of breath, you have to stop playing. And he connected my breathing to my actual, you know, soloing on the drum set. And what this does is it forces phrasing. It forces phrasing and the natural kind of ebb and flow of the way that, that phrases are put together. And, and that absolutely translates to stringed instruments along with wind instruments. It's just, we're just used to this sound. This is a this is a fantastic spot. I can hear the low end there somewhere in the mix. Mm, really, really low, coaxing, you know, 50, 60 hertz out of the mix. Again, the 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 quality, the quality, I keep hitting my mic, my apologies, folks. Uh, the quality of the uh, of the string library is really, really good. I like it. But nice, really, really nice job, Chris. Thanks you. Thank you so much for sending this along. Like I said, this was sent along during our week 40 weekly feedback thread. And we put weekly feedback threads every single week at 52 Qs. And if that's something that you're interested in, why don't you head over to 52Qs.com and sign up? It's free. It's free to join. So we would absolutely love to have you. Uh, but also, you know, if you enjoyed that feedback and, and would like feedback on your own cues, video feedback 
where I go in and break down even more, more elements like specific mix frequencies and form structure, the music theory side of things, loading your cues into a session and being able to provide a much deeper analysis. This is something I do offer at 52cues.com slash coaching along with one-on-one -on -one sessions. And we even have mastermind groups that meet every quarter. And so yeah, 52cues.com slash coaching and check that out. We would absolutely love, love to see you over there, but that's going to do it for me this week. You don't want to miss next week where I am taking your questions. I posted a, a question, uh, a Q and A thread over at 52Qs.com and folks have been asking questions all, all week long. And so I'm going to be answering your production music questions on next week's episode. But that's gonna do it for me this week. Once again, I have to give a huge shout out to the friends, family, and patrons of 52Qs who help keep all of this going. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you and I love you. None of this would be at all possible without you. So I hope you had a fantastic week 40 and I know your week 41 is gonna be amazing. How do I know that friends? Because I know and believe that the universe has amazing plans for you. Until next time, peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2022, Dave Croft, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the 52 Cues community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Cues.com.